This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. People around the world. And now, here's my conversation with Eric Brynjolfsson. You posted a quote on Twitter by Albert Bartlett saying that the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. Why would you say the exponential growth is important to understand? Yeah, that quote, I remember posting that. It's actually a reprise of something Andy McAfee and I said in the second machine age, but I posted it in early March when COVID was really just beginning to take off. And I was really scared. There were actually only a couple dozen cases, maybe less at that time, but they were doubling every like two or three days. And, you know, I could see, oh my God, this is going to be a catastrophe and it's going to happen soon. But nobody was taking it very seriously or not a lot of people were taking it very seriously. In fact, I remember I did my last um, in-person conference that week. I was flying uh, back from Las Vegas and uh, I was the only person on the plane wearing a mask. Yeah. And the flight attendant came over to me. She looked very concerned. She kind of put her hands on my shoulder. She was touching me all over, which I wasn't thrilled about. And she goes, oh, you know, are, do you have some kind of anxiety disorder? Are you okay? Yeah. And I was like, no, I'm, you know, it's because of COVID. And she's like, this is early March. Early March. But, um, you know, I was worried because I knew I could see or I suspected, I guess, that 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 doubling would continue. And it did. And, and pretty soon we had thousands of times more cases. Most of the time when I use that quote, I try to, you know, it, it's motivated by more optimistic things like Moore's Law. And the, you know, that's the way our physical world works. That's the way our brains are wired. Um, but if something doubles for 10 times as long, uh, you don't get 10 times as much. You get a thousand times as much and after 20 it's a billion after 30 it's a, a tr no sorry after 20 it's a million after 30 it's a billion and pretty soon after that it just gets to these numbers that you can barely grasp our world is becoming more and more exponential mainly because of digital technologies so more and more often our intuitions are out of whack and uh and that can be good in the case of things creating wonders, but it can be dangerous in the more often. So hanging around Silicon Valley, hanging around AI and computer researchers, I see this kind of exponential growth a lot more frequently. And I'm getting used to it, but I still make mistakes. I still underestimate some of the progress in just talking to someone about GPT-3 and how rapidly natural language has improved. But I think that as the world becomes more exponential, we'll all start experiencing it more frequently. The danger is that we may make some mistakes in the meantime using our old kind of caveman intuitions about how the world works. Well, the weird thing is it always kind of looks linear in the moment. Like the, every, you know, it's hard to feel, it's hard to uh, retros like introspect and really acknowledge. <laughs> Uh, other other uh, dysfunctions in our political and economic systems. So one guy that talks about exponential functions a lot is Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. uh, he seems to internalize this kind of way of exponential thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, he calls it first principles thinking, sort of the kind of yeah. going to the basics, asking the question, like what were the assumptions of the past, how we can... How can we throw them out the window? How can we do this 10x much more efficiently and constantly practice in that process? And also using that kind of thinking to estimate sort of uh, when, you know, create deadlines and estimate when you'll be able to deliver on some of these technologies. Now, it, it often gets him in trouble because he 
overestimates like he uh he doesn't meet the initial estimates of the deadlines mm -hmm. but he seems to deliver late but deliver right and, and which well, is kind of an interesting like what are your thoughts about this whole well, no, thing? Silicon Valley yeah. and he's experienced it in a lot of different applications so you know it's not as much of a shock to him anymore but that's uh that's something we can all learn from I, I in my own life I remember one of my first experiences um really seeing it was when I was a, a grad student and my my advisor asked me to plot the growth of computer power in the U.S. economy mm -hmm. uh, in different industries and there are all these you know exponentially growing curves and I was like holy shit look at this each in each industry it was just taking off and you know you don't have to be a rocket scientist to extend that and say wow this means that this was in the late 80s and early 90s that you know if it goes anything like that we're going to have orders of magnitude more computer power than we did at that time and of course we do so you know when people look at Moore's law they often talk about it as just so the exponential function is actually um, a stack of S curves. Mm -hmm. So basically it's you milk or whatever, take it the most advantage of a particular little revolution and then you search for another revolution. And it's basically yes. revolutions stack on top of revolutions. Mm -hmm. Do you have any intuition about how the heck humans keep finding ways to revolutionize things? Well, first, let me just unpack that first point that I talked about exponential curves, but no exponential curve continues forever. Mm -hmm. um, it's been said that if anything can't go on forever, eventually it will stop. <laughs> and and that's very profound. <laughs> it's very profound, but it's it seems uh, that a lot of people don't appreciate that half of it as, as yeah. well either. And that's why all exponential functions eventually turn into some kind of S curve or, or, or stop in some other way, maybe catastrophically. And that's of happened with COVID as well. I mean, it was, it went up and then it, it sort of, you know, at some point it starts saturating the, the pool of people to be infected. Um, there's a standard epidemiological model that, that's based on that. Um, and it's beginning to happen with Moore's law or different generations of computer power. It happens with all exponential curves. The more remarkable thing as you allude in the second part of your question, is that we've been able to come up with a new S curve on top of the previous one and do that generation after generation with new materials, new processes, and just extend it further and further. Um, I don't think anyone has a really good theory about why we've been so sex successful in doing that. Um, it's great that we have been, and uh, I hope it, it continues for some time, but it's, uh, it, you know, one beginning of a theory is that there's huge incentives when other parts of the system are going on that clock speed of doubling every two to three years. If there's one component of it that's not keeping up, then the economic incentives become really large to improve that one part. It becomes a bottleneck and anyone who can do improvements in that part can reap huge returns so that the resources automatically get focused. On energy consumption has been declining by a factor of two. And for most of us, that's more important. You know, the new iPhones came out today as we're mm -hmm. recording this. I'm not sure when you're going to uh, make it Very available. Very soon after this, yeah. Um, and for most of us, you know, having the iPhone be twice as fast, you know, it's nice. But having it, the battery life longer, that would be much more valuable. And the fact that a lot of the progress in chips now is reducing energy consumption um, is probably more important for many applications than just the raw speed. Other dimensions of Moore's law are um, in AI and machine learning. Um, those tend to be very parallelizable functions, um, especially uh, deep neural nets. And uh, so instead of having one chip, you can have multiple chips or you can have a, a, a GPU, a graphic processing unit that goes faster and now special chips designed for machine learning, like tensor processing units. Each time you switch, there's another 10X or 100X improvement above and beyond Moore's law. So I think that the raw silicon isn't improving as much as it used to, but these other dimensions are becoming. Mm -hmm. 
types of data. Our, when we walk around with our phone, it's just broadcasting a huge amounts of digital data that can be used as training sets. And then last but not least, um, as they mentioned at OpenAI, op as they mentioned at OpenAI, there have been significant improvements in the techniques. You know, the core idea of deep neural nets has been around for a few decades, but the advances in making it work more efficiently have also improved a couple of orders of magnitude or more. So you multiply together, you know, a hundredfold improvement in computer power, a hundredfold or more improvement in... And that's one of the, I've seen arguments made and they seem to be pretty convincing that the bottleneck there is going to be how much data there is on the internet, which is a fascinating idea that it literally will just run out of human generated data to train on. It's uh, right. I know we make it to the point where it's consumed basically all of human knowledge or all yeah. digitized human knowledge. Yeah. And that will be the bottleneck. I mean, but the, the, the interesting thing with bottlenecks is you, people often use bottlenecks as a way to argue against exponential growth. They say, well, there's no way you can overcome this bottleneck, but we seem to somehow keep coming up in new ways to like overcome whatever bottlenecks the, uh, the critics come up with, which is fascinating. I don't know how you overcome the data bottleneck, but probably more efficient training algorithms. Yeah, well, you already mentioned that, that, that these training algorithms are getting much better at using smaller amounts of data. We also are just capturing a lot more data than we used to, especially True. in China, <laughs> yeah. but, but all around us. So those are both important. You know, in, in some applications, you can simulate the data, you know, video games, um, some of the, the self-driving car systems are, you know, simulating driving and... Uh, of course, that has some risks and weaknesses. Again, in a couple of weeks, what's your thoughts on autonomous vehicles? Like, where do we stand? Mm -hmm. what, well, like, as, as a as a problem that has the potential of revolutionizing the yeah. world. Well, you know, I'm really excited about that, but. I, it's become much clearer that the original way that I thought about it, most people thought about it, like, you know, will we have a self-driving car or not is way too simple. The, the better way to think about it is that there's a whole continuum of how much driving and assisting the car can do. I, I noticed that you're right next here to your next door to Toyota that's Research to Institute. That's a total accident. I love the TRI folks, but yeah. Have you talked to Gil Pratt? Uh, yeah, we're going to, we're supposed to uh, talk. It's it's kind of hilarious. So there's kind of the, op I think it's a good counterpart to say what Elon is doing. Um, and hopefully they can be frank in how what they think about each other, because I've heard both of them talk about it. Um, but they're much more, you know, this is an assistive, a guardian angel that watches over you as opposed to try to do everything. I think there's some things. really right angles and aren't very well described it's more like game theory yeah. um that's a much harder problem and requires understanding human motivations and um so there's a continuum there of some places where the cars will uh i'm smart enough to be humble <laughs> and not try to get between i i know there's very bright people on both sides of the argument yeah. i've talked to them and they make convincing arguments to me about how careful they need to be and the social acceptance um, some people thought that when uh, the first few people died from self-driving cars that would shut down the industry but it, it was more of a blip actually and you know so that was interesting um, of course there's still a concern that if, if, uh, if there could be setbacks if we, we do this wrong you know your listeners may be familiar with the different levels of self-driving, you know, level one, two, three, four, five. I think uh, Andrew Ang has convinced me that this idea of really focusing on uh, feasible over time. I mean, that's kind of like the Waymo approach, which is they, uh, they just now released, I think just like a day or two ago, a public, like anyone from the public in the... Um, and the Phoenix, Arizona, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, to, uh, you know, you can get a ride in a Waymo car with no person, no driver. Oh, the they've taken. 
like that. No, they, <laughs> <laughs> they've uh, way more in particular done a really good job of that. They, they actually have a very interesting infrastructure of remote like observation. So they're not, they're not controlling the vehicles remotely, but they're able to, it's like a customer service. They can yeah. at any time tune into the car. I, I bet they can probably remotely control it as well, but that's officially not the function that, <laughs> that they- Yeah, I can see that out. being a really, because I think the thing that's proven harder than maybe some of the early people expected was there's a long tail of weird exceptions. Yeah. So you can deal with 90, 99, 99.99% of the cases, but then there's something that just never been seen before in the training data. And humans, you know, more or less can work around that, although, let me be clear and note, there are about 30,000 human fatalities just in the United States and, and maybe a million worldwide. So they're far from perfect. But um, I think people have higher expectations of machines. They don't wouldn't tolerate that level of death and uh, damage from a machine. And so we have to do a lot better at dealing with those edge cases. And also the, the tricky thing that if I have a criticism for the Waymo folks, there's such a huge focus on safety where people don't talk enough about creating products that people that customers love that mm -hmm. human beings love using mm -hmm. you know it's very easy to create a thing that's safe mm -hmm. at the extremes but then nobody wants to get into it yeah and, well back to elon i think one of part of his genius was with the electric cars before he came along Electric cars were all kind of underpowered, really light, and they were sort of wimpy cars yeah. that, you know, weren't fun. And yeah. the first thing he did was, you know, he made a roadster that went zero to 60 faster than just about any other car yeah. and went the other end. And I think that was a, a really wise marketing move as well as a wise technology move. Yeah. It's difficult to figure out what the uh, right marketing move is for AI systems. That's always been... Uh, I think it requires guts and risk taking, which is uh, which is what Elon practices. I mean, to to the chagrin of perhaps investors or whatever. But it requires guts and risk taking. It also requires you know rethinking what you're doing. I think way too many people are unimaginative, intellectually lazy, and when they take AI, they basically say, "What are we doing now? How can we make a machine do the same thing? Yeah. Maybe we'll save some costs. We'll have less labor." And yeah, you know, it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world to do, but it's really not leading to a quantum change in the way you do things. You know, when uh, when Jeff Bezos um, said, hey, we're gonna use the internet to change how bookstores work, and we're gonna use technology, he didn't go and say, okay, let's, let's put a robot cashier where the human cashier is and leave everything else alone. Right. That would have been a very lame way to automate a bookstore. He's like went from soup to nuts and said, let's just, rethink it, we get rid of the physical bookstore, we have a warehouse, we have delivery, we have people order on a screen, and everything was reinvented. And that's been the story of these general purpose technologies all through history. In, in, in my books, I write about like electricity and how for 30 years, there was almost no productivity gain from the electrification of factories a century ago. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not because electricity is a wimpy, useless technology. We all know how awesome electricity is. It's because at first they really didn't rethink the factories. It was only after they reinvented them, and we describe how in the book, um, then you suddenly got a doubling and tripling of productivity growth. But it's the combination of the technology with the new business models, new business organization. That just takes a long time, and it takes um, more creativity than most people have. Can you maybe linger on electricity? Because that's a fun one. Like yeah. Well, well, sure, I'll tell you what, what happened. Before electricity, there were basically steam engines or sometimes water wheels. And to power the machinery, you had to have pulleys and crankshafts. And you really can't make them too long because they'll, they'll break the torsion. So all the equipment was kind of clustered around this one giant steam engine. You can't make small steam engines either because of thermodynamics. So, so you have one giant steam engine, all the equipment clustered around it, multi-story. They have it vertical to minimize the distance as well as horizontal. And then when they did electricity, they took out the steam engine. They got the biggest electric motor they could buy from General Electric or someone like that. And nothing much else changed. <laughs> it took until a generation of managers retired or died 30 years later that people started thinking, wait, we don't have to do it that way. You can make electric motors, you know, 
big, small, medium. You can put one with each piece of equipment. There's this big debate if you read the management literature between what they call group drive versus unit drive, where every machine would have its own motor. Well, once they did that, once they went to unit drive, those guys won the debate. Um, then you started having a new kind of factory, which is sometimes sp spread out over acres. Single basically reinvented their industries. I mean, one other interesting point about all that is that during that reinvention period, you often actually not only don't see productivity growth, you can actually see a slipping back. Measured productivity actually falls. I just wrote a paper with Chad Severson and Daniel Rock called the Productivity J-Curve, which basically shows that in a lot of these cases, you have a downward dip before it goes up. And that downward dip is when everyone's trying to like reinvent things. And you could say that they're creating knowledge and intangible assets, but that doesn't show up on anyone's balance sheet. It doesn't show up in GDP. So it's as if they're doing nothing. Like take self-driving cars, we we're just talking about it. There have been hundreds of billions of dollars spent developing self-driving cars. And Basically, no chauffeur has lost his job. No taxi driver. I guess I got to check out the ones. Big J-curve. <laughs> yeah. So there's a bunch of spending and no real yeah. consumer benefit. Now, they're doing that in the belief, I think the justified belief, that they will get the upward part of the J-curve and there will be some big returns. But in the short run, you're not seeing it. That's happening with a lot of other AI technologies, just as it happened with earlier general purpose technologies. And it's one of the reasons we're having relatively low productivity growth lately. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. as an economist, one of the things that disappoints me is that as eye-popping as these technologies are, you and I are both excited about some of the things they can do. The economic productivity statistics are kind of dismal. We actually, believe it or not, have had lower productivity growth in the past about 15 years than we did in the previous 15 years in the 90s and early 2000s. And so that's not what you would have expected if, if these technologies were that much better. But I think we're in, a, in kind of a, a long J curve there. Personally, I'm optimistic. We'll start seeing the upward tick um, maybe, maybe as soon as next year. But um, uh, the past decade has been a bit disappointing if you thought there's a one-to-one -one relationship between cool technology and higher productivity. Well, what would you place your biggest hope for productivity increases on? Because you kind of said at a high level AI, but if I were to think about what has been so revolutionary in the last 10 years, I would, 15 years, and thinking about the internet, I would say things like, uh, hopefully I'm not saying anything ridiculous, but everything from Wikipedia to Twitter. Mm -hmm. So like these kind of websites, not so much AI, but like, I would expect to see some kind of big productivity increases from just the connectivity between people and uh, the access to inf more information. Yeah, well, so that's another area I've done quite a bit of research on actually, is these free goods like Wikipedia, Facebook, Twitter, Zoom. We're actually doing this in person, but yeah. almost everything else I do these days is, uh, is online. Um, the interesting thing about all those is most of them have a price of zero. You know, what do you pay for Wikipedia? Maybe like a little bit for the electrons to come to your house. It's <laughs> basically yeah. zero, right? Yeah. Um, uh, t take a small pause and say, I donate to Wikipedia often. You should too. Cause that good makes for you. It. Yeah. So, but what does that do mean for GDP? GDP is based on the price and quantity of all the goods, things bought and sold. If something has zero price, you know how much it contributes to GDP? To a first approximation, zero. Mm -hmm. So these digital goods that we're getting more and more of, we're spending more and more hours a day consuming stuff off of screens, little screens, big screens, um, that doesn't get priced into GDP. It's like they don't exist. Um, that doesn't mean they don't create value. I get a lot of value from watching cat videos and reading Wikipedia articles and listening to podcasts, even if I don't pay for them. Um, so we've got a mismatch there. Now, in fact, 
it. He said that. And they just use it. It's like, how well off are we? What was GDP last year? It was 2.3% growth or whatever. Um, that is how much physical production, but it's not the value we're getting. We need a new set of statistics. And I'm working with some colleagues, Avi Collis and others, um, to develop something we call GDP-B. GDP-B measures the benefits you get, not the cost. If you get benefit from Zoom or Wikipedia or Facebook, then that gets counted in GDP-B, even if you pay zero for it. So by the exact same amount. Um, that's something we need to fix. I'm working with the statistical agencies to come up with a new set of metrics. And uh, you know, over the coming years, I think we'll see, we're not gonna do away with GDP, it's very useful, but we'll see a parallel set of accounts that measure the benefits. How, how difficult is it to get that B in the GDP? It's, it's pretty hard. I mean, the thing, one of the reasons it hasn't been done before is that you know you can measure at the cash register what people pay for stuff, but how do you measure what they would have paid, like what the value is? That's a lot harder. You know, how much is Wikipedia worth to you? That's what we have to answer. And to do that, what we do is um, we can use online experiments. We do massive online choice experiments. We ask hundreds of thousands, now millions of people to do lots of sort of A-B tests. How much would I have to pay you to give up Wikipedia for a month? Mm -hmm. How much would I have to pay you to Brilliant. stop using your phone? And in some cases, it's hypothetical. In other cases, we actually enforce it, which is kind of expensive. Like we, we pay somebody $30 to stop using Facebook and we see if they'll do it. And, yeah. and some people will give it up for $10. Some people won't give it up even if you give them $100. That's awesome. And then you get a whole demand curve. You get to see what all the different prices are and what how much value different people get. And not surprisingly, different people have different values. We find that women tend to value Facebook more than men. Hmm. Old people tend to value it a little bit more than young people. I was interesting. I think young people maybe know about other networks that I don't know the name of that are better than Facebook. Um, and, uh, and so you get to see these, like these patterns, but you know, every person's individual. And then if you add up all those numbers, you start getting a, a uh, an estimate of the value. Okay. First of all, that's brilliant. Is this uh, work that you uh, will soon eventually? It's, it's on my website. So yeah, we, we have some more papers coming out on it, but the first one, uh, is already out. You know, it's kind of a fascinating mystery that Twitter, Facebook, like all these social networks are free. And it seems like almost none of them, except for YouTube, have experimented with removing ads for money. Mm -hmm. Can you like, do you understand that from a, both economics and the product perspective? Yeah, it's something that, you know, so I teach a course on digital business models. So I used to, I used to at MIT, at, at Stanford. I'm not quite sure. I'm not... <laughs> I think economists underestimate the power of volunteerism and, and donations. Um, you know, National Public Radio. Actually, how do you do this podcast? How is this? Uh, what's the revenue model? There's sponsors at the beginning, and then okay. and people. The funny thing is, I tell people they can. It's very. I tell them to the timestamp. So if you want to skip the sponsors, you you're free. Uh, but the it's funny that a bunch of people. So I read. Yeah. the the advertisement and they, a bunch of people generic news and things like that then you tend to do better with um advertising if it's uh a good that's only useful to a small number of people but they're willing to pay a lot they have a very high uh value for it then you advertising isn't going to work as well and you're better off charging for it both of them have some inefficiencies and then when you get into targeting and you get into these other revenue models it gets more complicated but there's some economic theory on it. I also think, to be frank, there's just a lot of experimentation that's needed because um, sometimes things are a little counterintuitive, especially when you get into what are called two-sided networks or platform effects, where um, you may grow the market on one side and harvest the revenue on the other side. You know, Facebook tries to get more and more users, and then they harvest the revenue from advertising. Um, so that's another way of, of kind of thinking about it. Is it strange to you that they haven't experimented? Well, they are experimenting. So, I, I, you know, they, they are doing some experiments about what the willingness is of, for people to pay. Yeah. Um, I, 
I think that when they do the math, it, it's going to work out that, that they still are better off with an advertising driven model. But, um, what about a mix? Like this is what's yeah. what YouTube is, right? Yeah. It's, uh, you, uh, you allow the person to decide the customer to decide yeah. exactly which model they prefer. Yeah. No, that can work really well, you know, and newspapers, of course, have known this for a long time. The Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, they have subscription revenue. They also have advertising revenue. And uh, uh, that can that can definitely work. The, online, it's a lot easier to have a dial that's much more personalized and everybody can kind of roll their own mix. And I could imagine, um, you know, having a little slider about um, how much advertising you want or are willing to take. And if it's done right, and it's incentive compatible, it, it could be a win-win where, where both the content provider and the consumer are better off than they would have been uh, before. Yeah, you know, the done right part is a uh, is really good point. Like with, the, with Jeff Bezos and the single click purchase on Amazon, the frictionless yeah. effort there. If I could just rant for a second about the Wall Street Journal, all the newspapers you mentioned mm -hmm. is, I have to click so many times yeah. to subscribe to them that I'm I literally don't subscribe just because of the number of times I have to click. I'm totally with you. I don't understand why so many companies make it so hard to sign. I mean, another example is when you buy a new iPhone or a new computer, or whatever. You, I feel like okay, I'm gonna like lose an afternoon just like loading up and getting all my yeah. stuff back, and and for a lot of us that's more of a deterrent than the price. Yeah. <laughs> and if they could, you know, make it painless, we'd give them a lot more money. So I'm hoping somebody listening is, is working <laughs> on, uh, on making it more painless for us to yeah. buy your products. If we could just like linger a little bit on the social network thing, because, uh, you know, there's this Netflix uh, social dilemma. Yeah, no, I and, saw that. And, and, uh, and Tristan Harris and company, yeah. And, and you know people's data people are it's really sensitive and and social networks are at the core arguably of uh, many of societal like tension and some of the most right. important things happening in society so it feels like it's important to get this right it is both from a business model perspective and just like a trust perspective i i still gotta i mean it just still feels like I, I know there's experimentation going on. It still feels like everyone is afraid to try different business models, like really try. Well, I'm worried that people are afraid to try different business models. I'm also worried that some of the business models may lead them to bad choices. And, um, you know, Danny Kahneman talks about system one and system two, sort of like our reptilian brain that reacts quickly to what we see, see something interesting, we click on it, we retweet it versus our system two, you know, our frontal cortex that's supposed to be more careful and rational that really doesn't make as many decisions as it should. Um, I think there's a tendency for a lot of these social networks to really exploit system one, our quick. Did a, a terrific paper in the cover of Science and when they document what we all feared which is that lies spread faster than truth on yeah. social networks. They looked at a bunch of tweets and retweets, and they found that false information was more likely to spread further, faster to more people. Yeah. And why was that? It's not because people like lies. It's because people like things that are shocking, amazing. Can you believe this? Something that is not mundane, not that something everybody else already knew. And what are the most unbelievable things? Well, lies. <laughs> and so you, if you wanna find something unbelievable, it's a lot easier to do that if you're not constrained by the truth. So they found that the, the emotional valence of false information was just much higher. It was more likely to be shocking and therefore more likely to be spread. Another interesting thing was that that wasn't necessarily driven by the algorithms. Um, I know that there are, is some evidence, uh, you know, Zenep Tefeki and others have pointed out in YouTube, some of the algorithms unintentionally were tuned to amplify more extremist content. But um, in the study of Twitter that Sinan and Deb and others did, um, they found that even if you took out all the bots and all the uh, 
automated tweets, you still had lies spreading significantly faster. It's just the problem is with ourselves that we just can't resist passing on this salacious content. The but I also blame the platforms because you know there's different ways you can design a platform. You can design a platform in a way that makes it easy to spread lies and to retweet and spread things on, or you can kind of put some friction on that and try to favor truth. I had dinner with Jimmy Wales once, you know, the guy who uh, helped found uh, uh, Wikipedia. Wikipedia. And uh, and he, he convinced me that, look, you know, you can make some design choices. <laughs> Speeding the truth, you know, either way, but, and, and I don't totally understand. Speeding the truth, I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, amplifying it and giving it more credit. Yeah. And, you know, like in, in academia, which is far, far from perfect, but, you know, when someone has an important discovery, it tends to get more cited and it, people kind of look to it more and sort of it tends to get amplified a little bit. So you could try to do that too. Um, I don't know what the silver bullet is, but I, I, the meta point is that if we spend time thinking about it, we can amplify truth over falsehoods. And I'm disappointed in in the heads of these social networks that they haven't been as successful or maybe haven't tried as hard to amplify truth. And part of it, going back to what we said earlier, is you know these revenue models may push them more towards growing fast, spreading information rapidly, getting lots of users, which isn't the same thing as finding truth. Yeah, I mean, Implicit in what you're saying now is a hopeful message that with platforms we can take a step towards uh, greater and greater popularity of truth. But the more cynical view is that what the last few years have revealed is that there's a lot of money to be made in dismantling the, even the idea of truth, mm -hmm. that nothing is true. Mm -hmm. And I've, as a thought experiment, I've been, you know, thinking about if it's possible that our future will have, like the idea of truth is something we won't even have. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible, like, in the future that everything is on the table in terms of truth and we're just swimming in this kind of digital economy mm -hmm. where ideas are just little toys that are not at all connected to reality. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely possible. I'm not a technological determinist, so I don't think that's inevitable. I don't think it's inevitable that it doesn't happen. I mean, the thing that I've come away with every time I do these studies and, and I emphasize it in my books and elsewhere is that technology doesn't shape our destiny. We shape our destiny. So just by us having this conversation, I hope that your audience is going to take it upon themselves as they design their products and they think about their use products as they manage companies. How can they make conscious decisions to favor truth over falsehoods, favor the better kinds of societies and not abdicate and say, well, we just build the tools. I think there was a, a saying that, uh, that was it the German scientists when they were working on the uh, the missiles um, in, in late World War II? You know, they said, "Well, our job is to make the missiles go up. Um, where they come down, that's someone else's department." Um, and you know, that's obviously a, a not the. I think it's obvious that's not the right attitude that technologists should have. That engineers. Should. It's the truth, but methods that lead to the truth. So maybe on a more personal question mm -hmm. if one were to try to build a competitor to twitter mm -hmm. what would you advise is there uh, i mean i mean the the bigger the, the meta question is that the right way to improve systems yeah no i i think that the underlying premise behind Twitter and all these networks is amazing that we can communicate with each other. And, and I use it a lot. There's a sub part of Twitter called Econ Twitter, where, you know, we economists uh, tweet to each other and, yeah. and talk about new papers. Something came out in the NBE. Real art to, to getting to the essence of things. Mm -hmm. So that's been great. Um, but um, it certainly, we all know that Twitter can be a cesspool of misinformation and uh, like i just said 
unfortunately, misinformation tends to spread faster on Twitter than truth. And there are a lot of people who are very vulnerable to it. I'm sure I've been fooled at times. There are uh, agents, whether from Russia or from political groups or um, others that explicitly create efforts at misinformation and efforts at getting people to hate each other. Or even more important lately, I've discovered is uh, is nut picking. You know, the idea of nut picking? No, what's that? It's a good term. Um, <laughs> nut picking is when you find... attention to this guy, like 12 people would see him and it'd be the end. Instead, with video or whatever, you you get mil- tens of millions of people say it. And, and I've seen this, you know, I look at it, I'm like, I get angry. I'm like, I can't believe that person did such things. Yeah. so terrible. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell all my friends about yeah. this terrible exactly. person. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and it's, uh, it's a great way to generate division. I, I, I talked to a, a friend who studied Russian misinformation campaigns and they're very clever about literally being on both sides of some of these debates. They would have some people pretend to be part of BLM, some yeah. people pretend to be white nationalists, and they would be throwing epithets at each other, saying crazy things at each other. And they're literally playing both sides of it, but their goal wasn't for one or the other to win. It was for everybody to get be hating and distrusting everyone else. So these tools can definitely be used for that, and they are being used for that. It's been super destructive for our democracy and our society. And the people who run these platforms, I think have a social responsibility, a moral and ethical personal responsibility to do a better job and to shut that stuff down as well. I don't know if you can shut it down, but to, to design them in a way that, that, you know, as I said earlier, favors truth over, over falsehoods and favors positive types of, um, uh, communication versus destructive ones. And just like you said, it's also on us, which I, I, yeah. I try to be all about love and compassion, and empathy on Twitter. I mean, one of the things, yeah. nut picking is a fascinating term. One of the things that people do that's, I think, even more dangerous is nut picking applied to individual statements of good people. So basically, yeah. worst case analysis in uh, computer science is uh, taking sometimes out of context, but sometimes in context, uh, a statement, one statement right. by a person, uh, like I've been, because I've been reading The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, I uh-huh. often talk about uh, Hitler on this podcast with uh-huh. folks, and it is so easy. That's really dangerous. <laughs> I'm, but I'm all leaning in. I'm 100%. Because, okay. well, it's actually a safer place than people realize because it's history and, and history mm-hmm in long form is actually very fascinating uh, to to think about. And it's, but I could see how that could be taken totally out of context. And it's It's very worrying about the, you know, these digital infrastructure, not just these disseminate things, but they're sort of permanent. So anything you say at some point, someone can go back and find something you said. So you just kind of like learn to be a little bit tolerant that like, okay, there's just, you know. uh, Yeah, I, I wonder who, the responsibility lays on there. Like, I think ultimately it's about leadership. Like uh, the previous president, Barack Obama has been, I think quite eloquent at walking this very difficult line of talking about cancel culture, Mm -hmm. but it's a difficult, it takes skill. Yeah. (laughs) Because you say the wrong thing and you piss off a lot of people. And so you have to do it well, but then also the platform, the technology is, should slow down, create friction in spreading this kind of nut picking in all its forms. Absolutely. And, no, and, and, and your point that we have to like learn. Someone invented fire, it's yeah. great cooking and everything, but then somebody burned himself. And then you had to like learn how to like avoid, or maybe somebody invented a fire extinguisher later and what. So, so you, you kind of like figure out ways of, of working around these technologies. Someone invented seat belts, et cetera. Um, and, and that's certainly true with all the new digital technologies that we have to figure out, not just um, technologies that protect us, but but ways of using them that um, emphasize that are more likely to be successful than, than dangerous. So you've written quite a bit about how artificial intelligence might change our world. Mm-hmm. How do you think 
if if we look forward again it's impossible to predict the future but if we look at trends in, from the past and we try to predict what's going to happen in the rest of the 21st century how do you think ai will change our world <laughs> that's a big <laughs> question uh, you know yeah. i'm mostly a techno optimist i'm not at the extreme you know the singularity is near end of the spectrum but i i do think that we are likely in for some significantly improved living standards, some really important progress, even just the technologies that are already kind of like in the can that haven't diffused. You know, when I talked earlier about the J curve, it could take 10, 20, 30 years for an existing technology to have the kind of profound effects. And when I look at whether it's, you know, vision systems, voice recognition, problem solving systems, even if nothing new got invented, we would have a few decades of progress. So I'm excited about that. And I think that's going to lead to us being wealthier, healthier. I mean, the healthcare is probably one of the applications that I'm most excited about. Um, so that's good news. I don't think we're going to have the end of work anytime soon. Um, there's just too many things that machines still can't do. Um, when I look around the world and, and think of whether it's it's childcare or healthcare, cleaning the environment, um, interacting with people, scientific work, artistic creativity, these are things that for now machines aren't able to do nearly as well as humans, even just something as mundane as you know folding laundry or whatever. And many of these I think are gonna be years or decades before. <music> Skill and move into other areas. Um, and that's probably what's going to be going on for the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years or, or more, a uh, kind of big restructuring of society. We'll get wealthier and people will have to do new skills. Now, if you turn the dial further, I don't know, 50 or 100 years into the future, then, you know, maybe all bets are off. Then it's possible that, that machines will be able to do most of what people do you know say one or 200 years i think it's even likely and at that point then we're more in the sort of abundance economy then we're loving each other and discussing philosophy and playing and, and doing all the other things that don't require work do you think you'd be surprised to see what the 20 like if we were to travel in time 100 years into the future do you think you'll be able to, like, if I gave you a month to like talk to people? No, like, let's say a week. Would you be able? Would you be able to understand what the hell's going on? You mean if I was there for a week? Yeah, if you were there for a week. A uh, hundred years in the future? Yeah. So, like, so I'll give you one thought experiment. Is like, isn't it possible that we're all living in virtual reality by then? Like, yeah. No, I think that's very possible. You know, I've played around with some of those VR headsets and they're not great, but I mean, the average person spends many waking hours staring at screens right now. You know, they're kind of low res compared to what they could be in 30 or 50 years. Um, but certainly games and why not uh, any other interactions could be done with VR and that would be a pretty different world and we'd all you know, in some ways be as rich as we wanted, you know, we could have castles and right. we could be traveling anywhere we want. Um, and it could obviously be multi-sensory. So that would be, that would be possible. And, you know, and of course, course there's well. people, you know, uh, you've had Elon Musk on and others, you know, there are people, Nick Bostrom, you know, makes the, the simulation argument that maybe we're already there. <laughs> <laughs> we're already there. So, but, but in general, or do you not even think about it in this kind of way, you're, self-critically thinking how good are you as an economist at predicting what the future looks like Do you well have a it starts getting i mean i feel reasonably comfortable in the next you know five ten twenty years in terms of um that path when you start getting truly superhuman artificial intelligence um kind of by definition, <laughs> be able to think of a lot of things that I couldn't have thought of and create a world that I couldn't even imagine. And uh, so I, I'm not sure I can, I can predict what that world is going to be like. One thing that AI researchers, AI safety researchers worry about is what's called the alignment problem. When an AI is that powerful, then um, they can do all sorts of things. And you really hope that their values are aligned with our values. 
And it's even tricky defining what our values are. I mean, first off, we all have different values. Mm -hmm. And secondly, maybe if we were smarter, we would have better values. Like, you know, I like to think that we have better values than he did in 1860 um, and uh, or in, you know, the year 200 BC on a lot of dimensions, things that we consider barbaric today. And it may be that if I thought about it more deeply, I would also be morally evolved. Maybe I'd be a vegetarian or, or do other things that, that uh, right now, um, whether my future self would consider kind of immoral. So um, that's a tricky problem, getting the AI to do what we want, assuming it's even a friendly AI. I mean, I, I should probably mention there's a non-trivial other branch where we destroy ourselves, right? I mean, there's a lot of exponentially improving technologies that could be ferociously destructive, um, whether it's in nanotechnology or biotech and weaponized viruses, AI, and other things that- Nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons, of course. The yeah. old school technology. Yeah, good old, good old nuclear weapons that could-, uh, could There's just too many ways to go wrong. There's a lot of ways to blow yourself up and people, uh, or I should say species, end up falling into one of those traps. The great filter. The great filter. I mean, there's an optimistic view of that. If there is literally no intelligent life out there in the universe, or at least in our galaxy, that means that we've passed at least one of the great filters or some of the great filters right. that we survived yeah. But, no, I, th I think I think Robin Hanson has a good way of, maybe others, they have a good way of thinking about this, that if there are no other intelligence creatures out there and that we've been able to detect, one possibility is that there's a filter ahead of us. And when you get a little more advanced, maybe in 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 years, things just get destroyed oh for some reason. Yeah. The other one is the great filters behind us. That, that would be good, is that most um, planets don't even evolve life, or if they don't evolve life, they don't involve intelligent life. Maybe we've gotten past that. And so now maybe we're on the good side of the, of the great filter. So, <laughs> uh, if we sort of rewind back and look at the, the thing where we could say something a little bit more comfortably at five years and 10 years out, mm -hmm. you've, uh, written about, we do have human level or superhuman level, narrow intelligence, narrow artificial intelligence. Um, and, you know, obviously my calculator can do math a lot better than I can. And there's a lot of other things machines can do better than I can. So which is which? We actually set out to address that question um, with Tom Mitchell. I wrote a, a paper called What Can Machine Learning Do? That was in science. And it, we went and interviewed a whole bunch of AI experts and kind of synthesized what they thought machine learning was good at and wasn't good at. And uh, we came up with what we called a, a rubric, uh, basically a set of questions you can ask about any task that will tell you whether it's likely to score high or low on uh, suitability for machine learning. And then we've applied that to a bunch of tasks in the economy. Um, in fact, there's a data set of all the tasks in the US economy, believe it or not, it's called ONET. Um, the US government put it together, part of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they divide the economy into about 970 occupations, like mm -hmm. you know, bus driver, economist, primary school teacher, radiologist. And then for each one of them, it, it, they describe which tasks need to be done. Mm. Like for radiologists, there are 27 distinct tasks. So we went through all those tasks to see whether or not a machine could do them. And what we found, interestingly, was- Brilliant study, by the way. That's thank, so awesome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so what we found was that there was no occupation in our data set where machine learning just ran the table and did everything. And there was almost no occupation where machine learning didn't have like a significant ability to do things. Like take radiology. A lot of people I hear it saying, you know, it's the end of radiology. And one of the 27 tasks is read medical images. Really important one, like it's kind of a core job. And machines have basically gotten as good or better than radiologists. There's just an article in uh, Nature last week, but you know they've been publishing them for the past few years um, showing that uh, um, machine learning can do as well as humans on many kinds of diagnostic imaging tasks. 
Um, but other things that radiologists do, you know, they sometimes administer conscious sedation. Uh, they sometimes do physical exams. They have to synthesize the results and explain to, to the other uh, uh, doctors or to the patients. In all those categories, machine learning isn't really up to snuff yet. So that job, we're going to see some, a lot of restructuring. Um, parts of the job, they'll hand over to machines. Others, humans will do more of. And that's been more or less the pattern in all of them. So, you know, to oversimplify a bit, we're going to see a lot of restructuring, uh, reorganization of work. And it's real going to be a great time. It is a great time for smart entrepreneurs and managers to, to do that reinvention of work. I'm not going to see mass unemployment. To get more specifically to your question, the kinds of tasks that machines tend to be good at are a lot of routine problem solving, mapping uh, inputs X into outputs Y. If you have a lot of data on the in Xs and the Ys, the inputs and the outputs, you can do that kind of mapping and find the relationships. They tend to not be very good at, for even now, fine motor control and dexterity, um, emotional intelligence and, and human interactions. Um, and thinking outside the box, creative work. If you give it a well-structured task, machines can be very good at it, but even asking the right questions, that's hard. There's a quote that uh, Andrew McAfee and I use in our book, Second Machine Age. Um, apparently, uh, Pablo Picasso was shown an early computer and he came away kind of unimpressed. He goes, well, I don't see what all the fuss is. All that does is answer questions. <laughs> and you know, to yeah. him, the interesting thing was asking the questions. Yeah. Try to replace uh, me, GPT-3, I uh, <laughs> dare you. Although some people think I'm a robot. You have this cool plot that shows, um, <laughs> I just remember where economists land, uh, where I mm. think the x-axis is the income. Yes. And then the y-axis is, I guess, aggregating the information of how replaceable the job is. Or I think uh, there's an index. It's for machine learning index. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we have all 970. <laughs> Um, a lot of things that cashiers, humans used to be needed for. Um, at the end of this other end of the spectrum, there are some jobs like uh, airline pilot that are among the highest paid in our economy, but also a lot of them are suitable for machine learning. A lot of those tasks are. Um, and then, yeah, you mentioned economists. I couldn't help peeking at those and, and they're paid a fair amount, maybe not as much as some of us think they should be. <laughs> but... Um, but likely to uh, worsen income inequality on a lot of dimensions so on the on this topic of uh the effect of ai on, on our on the landscape of work one of the people that have been speaking about it in the public domain public discourse is the presidential candidate andrew yang yeah uh, what are your thoughts about andrew what are your thoughts about ubi that uh universal basic income that he made one of the core ideas by the way he has like hundreds of ideas about like everything it's he kind does. of inter it's kind of interesting yeah but what are your thoughts about well, him and what are your thoughts about ubi let me answer you know the the the, the um question about his broader you know approach first i mean i just love that he's yeah. really thoughtful analytical i agree with his values so that's awesome and 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 he read my book and and, and mentions it sometimes so it makes me even more exciting um and uh the the thing that he really made the centerpiece of his campaign was ubi and i was originally kind of a fan of it and then as i studied it more i became less of a fan although i'm beginning to come back a little bit so let me tell you a little bit of my evolution you know as an economist we have by uh, looking at the the problem of people not having enough income and the simplest thing is well why don't we write them a check <laughs> right. problem solved but then i talked to my sociologist friends and people being and they really convinced me that just writing a check doesn't really get at the core values you know voltaire once said that uh, work solves three great ills boredom vice and need and uh you know you can deal with the need thing by writing a check but People need a sense of meaning, meaning they need something to do. And um, when, uh, you know, say steel workers or coal miners um, lost their jobs and were just given checks, alcoholism, depression, divorce, 
all those social indicators, drug use all went way up. People just weren't happy just sitting around collecting a check. Um, maybe it's part of the way they were raised. Maybe it's something innate in people that they need to feel wanted and needed. So it's not as simple as just writing people a check. You need to also give them a way to have a sense of purpose. And that was important to me. And the second thing is that, as I said, mentioned earlier, you know, we are far from the end of work. Uh, you know, I don't buy the idea that there's just like not enough work to be done. I see like our cities need to be cleaned up. Yeah. And I mean, robots can't do most of that. You know, we need to have better childcare. We need better healthcare. We need to take care of people who are mentally ill or older. We need to repair our roads. There's so much work that require at least partly maybe entirely a human component. So rather than like write all these people off, well, let's find a way to repurpose them and keep them engaged. Um, now that said, I do, would like to see more buying power um, from people who are sort of at the bottom end of the spectrum. The economy has been designed and evolved in a way that's I think very unfair to a lot of hardworking people. I see super hardworking people who aren't really seeing their wages grow over the past 20, 30 years, while some other people who have been you know, super smart and or super lucky have um, have had, you know, have made billions <laughs> or hundreds of billions. And uh, <laughs> or maybe for nothing. For, for nothing, uh, many of them, yeah. I mean, you know, an interesting point to make is, is you know, like, do we think that Bill Gates would have founded Microsoft if tax rates were 70%? Hmm. Well, we know he would have because they were tax <laughs> rates of 70% when he founded it, you know? So um, I don't think that's as big a deterrent. And we could provide more buying power to people. My own favorite tool is uh, the earned income tax credit, which is basically a way of supplementing income of people who have jobs and giving employers an incentive to hire even more people. The minimum wage can discourage employment, but the earned income tax credit encourages employment by supplementing uh, people's wages. You know, if uh, the employer can only afford to pay him $10 for a task, um, the rest of us pick in, kick in another 5 or $10 and bring their wages up to 15 or 20 total. And then they have more buying power. Then entrepreneurs are thinking, how can we cater to them? How can we make products for them? And it becomes a, a self uh, reinforcing system where people are better off. Andrew Eng and I had a good discussion where he uh, suggested instead of a, a universal basic income, he suggested, or instead of an unconditional basic income, how about a conditional basic income where the condition is you learn some new skills, we need to reskill our workforce. So let's make it easier for people to uh, uh, find ways to get those skills and get rewarded for doing them. And that's kind of a neat idea as well. That's really interesting. So, I mean, one of the questions, one of the dreams of UBI. That doesn't always, like there needs to be some incentive to reskill, to train, to learn a new thing. Well, I think it helps. I mean, there are lots of self-motivated people, but there are also people that, you know, maybe need a little guidance or, or help. Yeah. And, 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 and I think it's a really hard question for someone who is losing a job in one area to know what is the new area I should be learning skills in? And we could provide a much better set of tools and platforms that map said, okay, here's a set of skills you already have. Here's something that's in demand. Let's create a path for you to go from where you are to where you know you need to be. So I'm a total, how do I put it nicely about myself? I'm totally clueless about the economy. It's not totally true, but pretty good approximation. If you were to try to fix our tax tax system, and uh, or maybe from another side, if there is fundamental problems in taxation or some fundamental problems about our, our economy, what would you try to fix? What would you try to speak to? You know, I definitely think our whole tax system, our political an economic system has gotten more and more screwed up over the past 20, 30 years. I you know, there's just some basic principles that have worked really well in 
the 20th century that we sort of forgot, you know, in terms of investing in education, investing in infrastructure, welcoming immigrants, having a tax system that um, was more progressive and fair. At one point, tax rates were on, on top incomes were, were significantly higher, and they've come down a lot to the point where, in many cases, they're lower now than they are for, for poorer people. Um, so, and we could do things like an earned income tax credit to get a little more wonky. I'd like to see more Peguvian taxes. What that means that? is you tax uh, things that are bad instead of things that are good. So right now we tax labor, we tax capital, and which is unfortunate because one of the basic principles of economics, if you tax something, you tend to get less of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, right now there's still work to be done and, and still capital to be invested in. But instead, we should be taxing things like pollution and congestion. Um, and if we did that, we would have less pollution. So a carbon tax is, a you know, almost every economist would say it's a no-brainer, whether they're um, Republican or Democrat. Greg Mankiw, who's head of George Bush's Council of Economic Advisors, or, or, or uh, Dick Schmalensey, who is the, uh, another Republican economist degree, and, and of course, uh, a lot of uh, Democratic uh, economists agree as well. If we taxed carbon, we could raise uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. We could take that money and redistribute it through and Invest in R&D and research, which is close to a free lunch is what we have. My uh, erstwhile MIT colleague, Bob Sola, got the Nobel Prize, not yesterday, but, but about 30 years ago, for um, describing that most improvements in living standards from, come from tech progress. And Paul Romer later got a Nobel Prize for noting that investments in R&D and human capital can speed the rate of tech progress. So if we do that, then we'll be healthier and wealthier. Yeah, from an economics perspective, I remember taking an undergrad econ, you mentioned econ 101. Mm -hmm. It seemed from all the plots I saw that R&D is an obvious, you, you call it, as close to free lunch as, right. as we have. It seemed like obvious that we should do more research. It is. Like what, what, like, <laughs> uh, you know, there's no, well, like, we should do basic research. I mean, so, so well, let me just be clear. It'd yeah. be great if everybody did more research. Um, and I would make this thing between applied development versus basic research. So applied development, like, you know, how do we get this, uh, this self-driving car, you know, feature to work better in the Tesla. That's great for private companies because they can capture the value from that. If they make a better self-driving car system, they can sell cars that are more valuable and they make money. So there's an incentive that there's not a big problem there. Uh, and, and smart companies, Amazon, Tesla and others are investing in it. The problem is with basic research, like coming up with core basic ideas, whether it's in nuclear fusion or artificial intelligence or biotech there, if someone invents something, it's very hard for them to capture the benefits from it. It's shared by everybody, which is great in a way, mm -hmm but it means that they're not going to have the incentives to put as much effort into it. There you need, it's a classic public good. There you need the government to be involved in it. And the U.S. government used to be investing much more in R&D, but we have slashed that part of the government really foolishly, and uh, we're all poorer, significantly poorer as a result. Growth rates are down. We're not having the kind of scientific progress we used to have. Um, it's been sort of a uh, a short term, you know, eating the seed corn, whatever you know, metaphor you want to use, yeah. where people grab some money, put it in their pockets today, but five, ten, twenty years later, they're a lot poorer than they otherwise would have been. So we're living through a pandemic right now, globally in the in the United States. Mm -hmm. From an economics perspective. How do you think this pandemic will change the world? It's been remarkable. And, you know, it's horrible how many people have suffered, the amount of death, the economic destruction. Um, it's also striking just the amount of change in work that I've seen. Um, in the last 20 weeks, I've seen more change than there were in the previous 20 years. Um, there's been nothing like it since 
probably the World War II mobilization in terms of reorganizing our economy. You know, the most obvious one is the shift to remote work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I and many other people stopped, you know, going into the office and yeah. teaching my students in person. I did a study on this with a bunch of colleagues at MIT and elsewhere. And what we found was that before the pandemic, at the beginning of 2020, about one in six, a little over 15% of Americans were working remotely. Um, when the pandemic hit, that grew steadily and hit 50%, roughly half of Americans working at home. So a complete transformation. And of course, it wasn't even, it wasn't like everybody did it. If you're an information worker, or professional, if you work mainly with data, then you're much more likely to work at home. If you're a manufacturing worker, you know, working with other people or physical things, then it wasn't so easy to work at home. And instead, those people were much more likely to become uh, laid off or unemployed. So it's been something that, that's had very disparate effects on different parts of the uh, workforce. Do you, th do you think it's gonna be... St uh, seminars, my academic seminars to Zoom. And I was surprised how well it worked. So it works. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously we were able to reach a much broader audience. So we have people tuning in from Europe and you know other countries, um, just all over the United States for that matter. Uh, I also actually found that it in many ways was more egalitarian. You know, we use the chat feature and other tools and grad students and others who might've been a little shy about speaking up, we now kind of have a more of ability for lots of voices and they're answering each other's questions. So you kind of get parallel. Like if someone had some a question about, you know, some of the data or a reference or whatever, then someone else in the chat would answer it. And the whole thing just became like a higher bandwidth, higher quality uh, thing. So, so I, I thought that was kind of interesting. I think a lot of people are discovering that these tools that, you know, thanks to, to technologists have been developed over the past uh, decade, they're a lot more powerful than we thought. I mean, of all the terrible things we've seen with COVID and the real failure of many of our institutions. And it's not going to snap all the way back to where it was before. One of the things that worries me is that the people with lots of followers on Twitter and people with voices, people that can, voices that can be magnified by, you know, reporters and all that kind of stuff are the people that fall into this category that we were referring to just now, where they can still function and be successful with remote work. Mm -hmm. And then there is a kind of quite quiet suffering of what feels like millions of people whose jobs are disturbed profoundly by this pandemic, but they don't have many followers on Twitter. Mm -hmm. What do we, and, and uh, again, I apologize, but I've been reading the rise and fall of the third Reich, and there's a connection to the depression on the American side. There's a deep, complicated connection to how suffering can turn into forces that potentially change the world in, in um, destructive ways. Right. So like, it's something I worry about is like, what yeah. is the suffering going to materialize itself in five, 10 years? Yeah. Is that something you worry about, think oh, about? It's like the center of what I worry about. And, and let me break it down to two parts. You know, there's a moral and ethical aspect to it that we need to relieve this suffering. I mean, I'm, I share the values of, I think, most Americans. We like to see shared prosperity or most people on the planet. And uh, we would like to see people not falling behind. And they have fallen behind, not just due to COVID, but in the previous couple of decades. Uh, median income has barely moved, you know, depending on how you measure it. Uh, and the incomes of the top 1% have, have skyrocketed. And our, part of that is due to the ways technology has been used. Part of it's been due to, frankly, our political system has continually shifted more wealth into to those people who have the powerful interests. So there's just, a, a, I think, a, a moral imperative to do a better job. And ultimately, we're all going to be wealthier if more people can contribute, more people have the wherewithal. But the second thing is that and uh, 
they are going to, you know, they want to smash the system in different ways in 2016 and, and 2018. And, and, and now I think there are a lot of people who are looking at the political system and they feel like it's, it's not working for them and they just want to do something radical. Um, unfortunately, demagogues have harnessed that in a way that, that is pretty destructive to the country. Um, and I, an analogy I see is what happened with trade. You know, almost every economist thinks that free trade is a good thing, that when two people voluntarily exchange, almost by definition, they're both better off if it's voluntary. Um, and so generally trade is, is a good thing. But they also recognize that trade can uh, lead to uneven effects, that uh, there can be winners and losers in, in some of the people um, who didn't have the skills to compete with somebody else or didn't have um, other assets. Um, and, and so trade can shift prices in ways that are averse to some people. Um, so there's a, a formula that economists have, which is that you have free trade, but then you compensate the people who were hurt and free trade makes the pie bigger. And since the pie is bigger, it's possible for everyone to be better off. You can make the winners better off, but you can also compensate those who, who don't win. And so they end up being better off as well. What happened was that we didn't fulfill that promise. We did have some more increased free trade in the 80s and 90s, um, but we didn't compensate the people who were hurt. And so they felt like the, you know, the people in power reneged on the bargain. And I think they did. And so then we, there's a backlash against trade. And now both political parties, but especially um, Trump and company, have really pushed back against um, free trade. Ultimately, that's bad for the country. Ultimately, that's bad for living standards. But in a way, I can understand that people felt they were betrayed. Technology has a lot of similar characteristics. Technology can make us all better off. It makes the pie bigger. It creates wealth and health, but it can also be uneven. Not everyone automatically benefits. It's possible for some people, even a majority of people to get left behind while a small group benefits. <laughs> the pie is bigger, we can make the rich richer, we can make the middle class richer, we can make the poor richer. Mathematically, everyone could be better off. But again, we're not doing that. You need to say, hey, technology sucks. We've got to stop it. Let's throw rocks at the Google bus. Let's blow it up. Let's blow it up. And, uh, you know, there were the Luddites uh, almost exactly 200 years ago who smashed the, the looms and the spinning machines because they felt like those machines weren't helping them. Um, we have a real imperative, not just to do the morally right thing, but to do the thing that is gonna save the country, which is make sure that we create not just prosperity, but shared prosperity. So you've been at MIT for over 30 years, ah, I think. Don't, don't tell me how old I am. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that's true, that's true. And uh, you're now, uh, moved to Stanford. I'm going to try not to say anything um, <laughs> about how great MIT is. Uh, what's that move been like? What um, it's East Coast to West Coast. One well, MIT is great. MIT has been very good to me. It continues to be very good to me. It's an amazing place. There's I continue to have so many amazing friends and colleagues there. I'm very fortunate to have been able to spend a lot of time at MIT. Stanford's also amazing. And part of what attracted me out here was not just the weather, but also, you know, Silicon Valley, let's face it, is really more of the epicenter of the technological revolution. And I want to be close to the people who are inventing AI and elsewhere. A lot of it is being invented at MIT, for that matter, in, in Europe and in China and elsewhere, um, India. But, um, but being a little closer to some of the key technologists was, was something that was important to me. And, and I, you know, it may be shallow, but I also do enjoy the good weather. And, I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, was, I, I felt a little ripped off when I came here, you know, a couple of months ago. And immediately there are the fires and, I, you know, yeah. my eyes were burning. The sky was orange and there's the heat waves. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it wasn't exactly what I've been promised, but um, I'm fingers crossed it'll, it'll get back to uh, better. So maybe 
uh, always kind of try to find the words to tell people that uh, these are magical places. Is there something that you can speak to? I feel very fortunate to be part of it. And I'm lucky in a so that I'm in a society where I can actually get paid for it and put food on the table while doing the stuff that I really love. And I hope someday everybody can have jobs that are, are like that. And, and I appreciate that it's not necessarily easy for everybody to have a job that they both love and also they get paid for. Um, so there are things that don't go well in academia, but by and large, I think it's a kind of, you know, kinder, gentler version of a lot of the world. Yeah, that's true. You know, exactly. I, I, we sort of cut each other a little slack on things like, uh, uh, you know, on just a lot of things. Yeah. Um, you know, of course, there's harsh debates and discussions about things and some petty politics here and there. I, I personally, I try to stay away from most of that sort of politics. It's not my thing. And so it doesn't affect me most of the time, sometimes a little bit, maybe. Um, but, um, but, you know, being able to pull together something, we have the digital economy lab, we get all these brilliant grad students and undergraduates and postdocs that are, uh, are just doing stuff that I, I learn from and, and every one of them has some aspect of what they're doing that's just, I couldn't even understand. It's like way, way more brilliant. And, and it's, that's really, to me, actually, I really en enjoy that, um, being in a room with lots of other smart people. And, uh, and Stanford has made it very easy to attract, you know, those people. Um, I just, you know, say I'm going to do a seminar or whatever, and the, the people come, they come and want to work with me. Um, we get funding, we get data sets, and it, it's uh, it's come together real nicely. Yeah, and the rest is just fun. It's fun, yeah. <laughs> and we feel like we're working on important problems, you know, and, and we're, we're doing things that, you know, I think are, are first order in terms of, what's important in the world and that's very satisfying to me maybe a bit of a fun question what three books technical fiction philosophical you've enjoyed had a big big impact in your life well i, I guess i go back to like my my teen years and and uh you know i read siddhartha which is a philosophical book and kind of helps keep me keep me centered about herman like hesse. Getting, yeah my herman hess exactly don't get too wrapped up in material things or other things and just sort of, you know, try to find peace on things. Um, a book that actually influenced me a lot in terms of my career was uh, called The Worldly Philosophers by uh, Robert Heilbrenner. It's actually about economists. It goes through a series of different economies it's written in a very lively form. I and mean, it probably sounds boring, but it, it, it did describe whether it's Adam Smith or Karl Marx or John Maynard Keynes and, and each of them sort of what their key insights were, but also kind of their personalities. And I think that's one of the reasons I became an economist was, was just understanding how they grapple with the big questions of the world. So would you recommend it as a good whirlwind uh, overview of the history of economics? Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly right. It kind of takes you through the different things. Um, and, and, you know, so you can understand how they reach thinking some of the strengths and weaknesses. I mean, probably is a little out of date now, it needs to be updated a bit. But you know, you could at least look through the, the first couple hundred years of economics, which is not a bad place to start. Uh, more recently, I mean, a book I really enjoyed is by my uh, my friend and colleague, Max Tegmark, called Life 3.0. You should have him on your podcast if you haven't already. He was no. episode number one. Oh and my he, God. And he's back, he'll be back, uh, he'll be back soon. Yeah, no, he's terrific. I, I love the way his brain works yeah, and he makes you think about profound things. He's got such a joyful approach yeah. to life. And uh, so that's been a great book. And, you know, you learn, I learn a lot from it. I think everybody but he d explains it in a way, even though he's so brilliant, that, you know, everyone can understand, that I can understand. Um, you know, that's three, but let me mention maybe one or two others. I mean, I, I recently read uh, More From Less by my, uh, my sometimes co-author, Andrew McAfee. Mm -hmm. It made me optimistic about how we can continue to have li rising living standards um, while living more lightly on the planet. In fact, because of higher living standards, because of technology, because of digitization that I mentioned, um, we don't have to have as big an impact on the planet. And uh, that's a, a great story to tell. And he documents it very carefully. Uh, 
you know, a, a personal kind of self-help book that I found kind of useful people is, is Atomic Habits. I, I think it's, uh, what's his name? James Clear. Yeah, James Clear. Yeah. Um, he's just, yeah, it's a good name because he writes very clearly. And, <laughs> you know, most of the sentences I read in that book, I was like, yeah, I know that. But it just really helps to have somebody like remind you and tell you and kind of just reinforce it. And, and uh, so build, build habits in your life that you, you hope to have... Uh, that have a positive impact and don't have to make it big things. It could be just tiny little. Exactly. I mean, the word atomic, it. it's a little bit of a pun. I think he says, you know, one atomic means they're really small. You take these little things, but also like atomic power, it can have like, you know, <laughs> That's big funny. impacts. That's funny. Yeah. The biggest ridiculous question, especially to ask an economist, but also a human being, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> I hope you've gotten the answer to that from somebody else. I think we're all still working on that one. <laughs> but um, what is it? You know, I actually learned a lot from my son, uh, Luke. And uh, he's he's uh, 19 now, but but he's always loved philosophy. And he reads way more sophisticated philosophy than I do. We, we, I once took him to Oxford. And he spent the whole time, like, pulling all these obscure books down and reading them. And a couple of years ago, we had this argument. Um, and he was trying to convince me that hedonism was the ultimate, you know, meaning of life, just pleasure yeah. uh, seeking. And, and <laughs> well, how old was he at the time? 17. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, but he, yeah. he made a really good like intellectual argument yes. for it too. And, you know, <laughs> of course. But, you know, it just didn't strike me as right. And, and I think that, um, you know, while I am kind of a utilitarian, like, you know, I do think we should do the greatest good for the greatest number, that's just too shallow. And, and I think I've convinced myself that, um, real happiness doesn't come from seeking pleasure it's kind of a little it's ironic like if you really focus on ha being happy I, I think it it doesn't work you gotta like be doing something bigger it, it's i think the analogy i sometimes use is um you know when you look at a dim star in the sky if you look right at it it kind of disappears but you have to look a little to the side and then the parts of your uh, your retina that are better at absorbing light you know can pick it up better it's the same thing with happiness i think you need to sort of find something other goal, something, some meaning in life. And that ultimately makes you happier than if you go squarely at just pleasure. And so for me, you know, the kind of research I do that I think is trying to change the world, make the world a better place. And I'm not like an evolutionary psychologist, but my guess is that our brains are wired not just for pleasure, but we're social animals and we're wired to like, help others and ultimately you know that's something that's really deeply rooted in our psyche and uh if we do help others if we do f or at least feel like we're helping others you know our reward systems kick in and we end up being more deeply satisfied than if we just do something selfish and shallow beautifully put i don't think there's a better way to end it eric you're one of the people when i first showed up at mit that made me proud to be at MIT. So it's so sad that you're now at Stanford, but it's, uh, I'm sure you'll do wonderful things uh, at Stanford as well. I, I can't wait till future books and people should definitely read. Well, thank you so books. much. And, and I think we're all, we're all part of the invisible college, as we call it. You know, we're all part of this uh, intellectual and human community where we all can learn from each other. It doesn't really matter physically where we are so much anymore. Beautiful. Thanks for talking today. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Eric Brinjalson, and thank you to our sponsors, Vincero Watches, the maker of classy, well-performing watches, Four Sigmatic, the maker of delicious mushroom coffee, ExpressVPN, the VPN I've used for many years to protect my privacy on the internet, and Cash App, the app I use to send money to friends. Please check out these sponsors in the description to get a discount and to support this podcast. If you enjoy this thing, subscribe on YouTube, review it with five stars on Apple Podcast, follow on Spotify, support on Patreon, or connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman. And now, let me leave you with some words from Albert Einstein. It has become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity. Thank you for listening, and hope to see you next time.
This is the Lex Free Podcast.